Thank you, Casey. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation. I've been here since um, Wednesday night, I guess, uh, is when I arrived, and it's my first time in Alaska. Thank you for the weather. I actually packed a, a thick jacket, and it has stayed in my closet the entire time here. Could not be any better. So, um, on um, last week, I talked uh, at uh, a number of events here and uh, earlier in the week, I guess yesterday, I uh, um, met with uh, some faculty to talk about my experiences at Oregon State University and how um, we how we do eCampus, how we do online learning, how we implemented some uh, new programs there and how we have grown from um, a smallish program and uh, a university that was, you know, okay to now one of the uh, major contenders in online learning. Uh, just to give you an idea, last year we were ranked number 46 as the um, best online universities in the country. This year we are number five. And uh, I always say that because our president says it, so I think you know I should say it too. Uh, so here it is, we're number five now. And uh, I'm going to explain a little bit how we did that, give you an idea how um, language has contributed to that success and to uh, that uh, rise, the, the climbing up uh, in the ranking. But before I do that, I, um, I would like to know where you are from, because I understand that some of you teach in languages, some of you are administrators, and uh, it will give me a, a, an idea what, what to say and what not to say, basically, so how to, how to tailor my, uh, my uh, talk to you. So how many of you are in languages? How many of you teach languages? Great. Thank you. Um, how many of you are in a in an administrative position in the humanities? And in the sciences? Administrator in the sciences? Any other administrator? <laughs> Great, thank you. And faculty not teaching languages but teaching something else? Great, thank you. What, just um, out of uh, pure interest, what, what are your fields? Computer science. B computer science. Oh, computer. I heard beer science. I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> my man. <laughs> computer. Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> yes. Uh, theater and film. Theater and film, great. And linguistics. Linguistics, wonderful. School of Education. Perfect. This is wonderful because you will see that some of my, uh, like some portions of my talk will apply to other fields as, as well. You know, in fact, all of uh, the entire talk will or might help you figure out how you could, if you are so inclined, could develop uh, online programs, an online course, an online presence or um, how you could talk to colleagues, how you could maybe overcome your fear um, of uh, online learning. And this is why I entitled my talk, Navigating Change, the uh, Online Language Teaching in the 21st Century. So um, just out of curiosity, again, because I'm a very curious person, online language learning, what do you associate with that when you hear, you know, languages, language teaching online? What comes to your mind? Rosetta. Rosetta Stone. Yes, my friend. Yes. Rosetta. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. What else? Mm -hmm. To me, it's one of the hardest subjects to teach online. Very good. Yes. And of course, uh, I, I feel with you, and that was exactly what we felt when we, th we started this program. It's hard. Um, I don't want to say impossible because it is possible, but we felt at times that it was a huge, there were huge hurdles that we needed to overcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do I, how do I present like the points of articulation in ways that, you know, my students do learn um, the sounds and stuff. Yeah, very good. So how, how do we adapt what we teach uh, in a face-to-face -face classroom to online learning? How do we make sure that our students learn? How do we, do we make sure that the things that we want them to learn, how can we transfer that and translate that into the online classroom? Mm -hmm. And how do you turn to your neighbor and practice? what we just did. Absolutely, and what we do in the classroom every day, especially in the language classroom, the interaction always with other people, interacting with peers, the oral component. Um, so I, I want to share something with you that uh, our faculty, my colleagues, and I, I don't know if you, can you actually see that in the back? Okay, great, thank you. So you will see, you will recognize a, a number of things that you just brought up and many, many more because these were concerns that we as faculty, and I'm an associate professor of German, so I teach languages, I'm in the classroom every day. Um, I always say I'm not an administrator and I do not work for our online learning eCampus department. I am in the classroom. I teach face-to-face, -face, I teach hybrid, and I teach online. 
So, but these were concerns that we as faculty had, and especially as language faculty. You know, how, how do we do that? The notion that languages cannot be taught online ever, because you know, we need the interaction, we need to talk, we need to be able to, uh, to communicate with, with uh, the other students and with the instructor in the classroom. What about the oral proficiency? You know, so how do we accomplish that? How can a student sitting somewhere uh, in front of a computer, how can she or he actually learn a language and speak? You know, that goes beyond the Rosetta Stone, put the CD in, listen and repeat and so on. The, uh, there was the, uh, the uh, I guess, the, the, the notion that students would prefer face to face, you know, and you see a number of other things. Technology, we always have technology issues at Oregon State University. And you do too, because setting up here was an experience in itself. So yes, and it, it is the reality, you know, you cannot rely on technology. Things do go wrong all the time. Um, what about the isolation between students and faculty? You know, how can you create that community that you create in the classroom through computers that might be somewhere in remote areas of uh, the state or maybe even beyond the state? Um, the learning outcomes, you know, again, for languages, speaking, 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 how can I make sure that the students come out with the same proficiency level? Uh, the workload for faculty, do we have to work more? You know, who pays for the development of classes? Can we teach these classes in load or as overload? You know, all of these details. And uh, yeah, and again, you know, who is going to compensate me for all of the work that I have to put in in the front end before I can actually teach a class? I uh, shared in one of these events, I shared uh, um, um, a graph that compared my workload as a faculty member teaching face-to-face -face versus online courses. And it went like this, you know, so it started out by um, the um, time that I need to put in as an online instructor before I even teach a class was right around 200 hours, you know, before day one. And uh, so, but who's going to pay for that? Do I do that on top of things? You know, I have no time anyway. How do we do that? And, uh, you know, then, of course, uh, the practical things for our students. What happens when things go wrong? Who helps our students? Who proctors the tests? You know, can they just have the book open right next to them when they take the test? Or um, who, who helps them when they have problems with the homework? They cannot just walk into your office hours. You know, all of that doesn't work. So all of these concerns were concerns we had. And there were some, some uh, myths and you know, the, you will see some overlap here. So online learning outcomes uh, and face-to-face -face learning outcomes, there is the myth that you know, these are not the same and online learn learning cannot be as good, as effective as face-to-face uh, -face learning. It, it truly is a myth, let me tell you right away, because uh, we have shown exactly the opposite, that online and hybrid learning for our students all across the languages is much, much better. Um, the fear that online learning will replace classroom teaching, you know, so what if we don't like online teaching or what if we think we don't like online teaching? Will we become obsolete? And or will we be forced to teach online? The time savings component and uh, things like the students, you know, what if students hate being, uh, being taught online? What if they like being in the classroom with us? What if they like talking to us, coming to see us, learning from us directly. So essentially all of the things that you see here um, are things that we struggled with and we thought we needed to figure out what to do at OSU. Because uh, in 2008 we were forced with, with uh, budget cuts and so one of the solutions that uh, we came up with was an online presence. You know, trying to figure out how to teach online, not to save money, but to complement what we did in our face-to-face -face classes, to see if we would be able to grow our programs, to attract new students, not to shift the students from face-to-face -to, -face to online, but uh, to look beyond what we offered at the university. So this is why we started the um, online programs here. So I brought, because uh, most of us are um, we, we only believe in research, right? We want to see evidence, and I might tell you a lot of things, but we want to see that other people have written about it. And uh, so I brought you a couple of sources here. People who, who have uh, written about the challenges in 
the online classroom and in particular the online language learning classroom. And if you look at the dates of these publications, the, uh, the earliest of the publications I believe I have here is 2005. This is a relatively young field, you know, pretty much like online learning in general, that a lot of the, it is still uncharted ground and we are trying to figure out how to do that. You know, how can we do that? How can we make sure that we uh, get all of the things done that need to get done, how can we create a, a successful online learning experience? So um, if you just go through that, you see that these uh, publications address a lot of these challenges. And uh, a number of these uh, scholars have no answers either. They just, they make us aware of, uh, you know, the problems that we are facing. And uh, you know, we're trying to figure out how can we create these structures that uh, needed to happen. You know, the question of the teachers, uh, especially language te teachers and online language teachers, if no one has experience in uh, teaching languages online, who do we bring in to teach these classes? Um, are there any models we can use? And I think uh, some of you might have a similar experience. What if there is no other model out there for your field? Or what if that model is one that may not be appropriate for a university like UAF, you know, what if you just have a huge private uni uh, university with a large endowment, probably doesn't apply, you know, you don't have the same structure, so how do you make that work? And uh, <clears throat> all of these problems are problems we had to... And uh, so we started doing some research and we started doing some studies and here are some, um, some, some findings from these studies, from the research we did from looking at the students, from comparing uh, the face-to-face -face classroom to the online classroom. We compared subsets of students in first year Spanish, for example, in second year German, just to see how it would play out. The students who were taking the uh, online classes and the face-to-face -face classes. And uh, we, I mean, much like you, if you look at that right now, we were uh, tremendously surprised by the outcomes because we found, for example, right here, no significant difference between students taking online classes and students taking the face-to-face -face classes in the learning outcomes. So essentially, the way to accomplishing these learning outcomes was different, but the learning outcomes the students accomplished and the online students accomplished much better. So again, to give you an example, oral proficiency, first year Spanish, this, uh, um, the subset of students in online, in a, in a course of online Spanish and in a course of uh, the on-campus Spanish, the uh, students in the online classroom came out with uh, um, a much higher median grade and much better oral proficiency. So they had an, an easier time transitioning into second year uh, Spanish than the, uh, the, the face-to-face students. And uh, we can talk about that um, in the, the end why that is. There are a number of uh, of factors, I think, that influence this. <coughs> the students, <coughs> excuse me, the students who uh, take part of their co uh, course online perform better than face to face, or at least in the hybrid model. And I think that has to do with uh, the fact that um, a lot of the time we're dealing with digital natives. You know? So, um, or students who, the non traditional students who uh, need some flexibility, the students who uh, have a family, have uh, um, other, um, other things that they need to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so just giving them the flexibility to do all of the work might be one way to get out of that. Um, and then again, you know, we made the big mistake initially of transferring some of the content, the face-to-face uh, -face content just online, and that failed and we had to redo it because we needed to figure out different ways. And so, <coughs> I'm going to talk about the BA in, in, uh, in German as one of the examples and I'm going to walk you through the program just by looking at the program in general and by looking at an, a number of courses and a number of strategies that we implemented to uh, create the curriculum and to create these courses. So as you can see, the, um, <coughs> one of the new stores that um, our eCampus uh, department uh, uh, ran was that it talked about ample face-to-face -face time in the online classroom and that was important because like you the number one question was you know how can we speak 
as a student, as a prospective student, you go there and you say, well, I really want to learn, learn German. I want to get a German degree, but how can you make me speak after these four years? How can I be fluent or near native or whatever these students thought they would be able to do in four or five years of studying a language, so coming out of that language degree. And uh, so um, our first step was to figure out how can we give them enough speaking time. The way we do this right now, and I know that this is probably the most interesting to you, is we ask students in the beginning of the quarter to sign up for um, um, uh, um, Google Hangouts that take place every other week, groups up to four students and the instructor kind of call in through the Google Hangout and they speak for 20 to 30 minutes. So in a small group setting, it's a very intensive dialogue that uh, is taking place there and every student goes through that. So every other week they have one of these intensive uh, 20 to 30 minute sessions practicing their spoken German. In addition to that, we have a number of tutors who uh, are available online for, uh, for students so they can Skype with these German tutors to practice their German uh, on the side. There are a number of assignments that students do throughout the week. They send in uh, videos that they record, they engage in dialogues with other students, they sign up uh, for uh, mini conversation sessions with peers from their courses and they record these sessions and send them into uh, the instructor and the instructor grades these and gives them feedback. So again this uh, ample face-to-face -face time in an online environment was very important. <clears throat> now of course you're only uh, hearing from me and uh, what I like to do is I like to uh, have my colleagues tell you too how they feel about it. What I uh, brought in, and I, I just, I'm just going to share a couple of minutes of this uh, video that we as German faculty uh, created for our prospective students here. Um, and so if you just look at, I guess, uh, obviously the content, but also the enthusiasm, we all believe that this will work and that this is working. And we were trying to convey that in this video uh, to our prospective students. German at OSU is, it's a, it's a pretty cool experience. German at OSU is a program that includes language classes, um, it includes a lot of film classes, even some literature classes and classes that prepare students to start the professional world, like start their professional life in Germany. I think we are a little bit different than other programs, so we try to distinguish ourselves from, from uh, programs like uh, the German program at the UFO or at PSU. It's this kind of sense of community that we're trying to build. We launched the first ever completely online German major in the country. We are the only program in the nation uh, offering an online degree, a major in German, in addition to the minor. So there are a bunch of universities offering a minor in German, but OSU is the only one with a major. And we now have 40 online majors. What the online major, um, in my mind, has, has done is to reveal that German is still relevant. It is still a language that people want to learn for business, for travel, um, for exchange, for study abroad, for, for any number of reasons. It seems that German is relevant to people. It seems that people want to learn it. So it's our goal to offer the highest quality online language education possible. It's growing all the time. It's growing all the time, yeah, and we're always developing new classes. We're, we're coming away from the traditional degree in literature, focused on national literature. We're looking at language and the study of language as a way into understanding the way uh, global media work. One of uh, the core elements is uh, what we call media literacy, teaching students how to approach a number of different media. And so what we're looking to do is to really train students in the ability to read and understand the way media crosses these national and international boards. Train students to uh, read a number of different texts, and texts is not just you know the written word, but also films. Fast, pretty, accessible everywhere. I think this kind of open source education that's available online is definitely the future. We're getting students from all around the country. I have students from Georgia and the East Coast, and students who are actually living in Germany right now. German at OSU is really trying to 
to hone in on what OSU students need. So it's our job to observe what students need and what they want in order to be proficient in the German language. We are always willing to work with students to help develop things that they're interested in. Whatever your interests are, you can find people who are interested in it. Whatever your professional goals are, you can find people who are also pursuing those goals in German. We really do listen to our German majors and minors. It's like, okay, so what would you like to do? We're working really hard right now to attract uh, engineers at OSU to learn German. We try to cater to students who are interested in the sciences. It's just gold, this combination of an engineering degree, like particularly like mechanical engineering, plus German is just career gold. There are so many opportunities in engineering in Germany. To make sure that they're getting what they want to. Yeah, so maybe I'll stop here for uh, for the moment. Um, so I think you could see that uh, you know we're playing all of the different fields here, trying to attract a number of like a really diverse audiences uh, audience. I think what is important to uh, note here is that the online student population is a non-traditional student population largely, and this is why we made this video because we also wanted to bring in those students who otherwise had no opportunity of taking uh, German. So non-traditional students, you know, we have a lot of students who um, would otherwise not be able to take our classes in Corvallis. We have a large military population, we have a large uh, a portion of students with disabilities, we have, you know, the single mom, we have uh, high school students uh, taking our classes because German has been phased out of their high school and so on and so forth. You know, we have students in countries without access to higher education otherwise, um, you know, the students in Iraq, the students in, uh, in Japan, we have students taking our program from Germany and so on. So it's, it's really a wide variety. But of, of course, we also wanted to bring in the students and the student population, the engineers who have such a, a packed curriculum that they would not have uh, otherwise been able to take our classes. So um, what does our curriculum and our program look like? If, uh, Right now we're still using Blackboard and it has that little asterisk because we're now facing out Blackboard and trans, uh, uh, moving to Canvas as our LMS. And uh, the, um, all of these courses here are completely uh, accessible through Blackboard or now through Canvas. So all our students need is a computer and an internet connection. And the computer needs to have a camera and a microphone. And that's it. Everything else is located in uh, the the course site on now on canvas and everything has kind of a standardized form and that's also important so we came up with kind of a matrix for um, the left hand uh, uh, side the left column here so that students would always find it easy to transfer from one course to another you know they would only have to look at one course and they would know in the future where to find the things so things like uh, a course that does wikis, it's always going to be here. Here the Blackboard recorder, you know, so to record your own uh, videos. Um, always right there. Very easy to find and, you know, very transparent for students. And again, everything is, uh, is in there. Within these courses, we're on the quarter system. So in these courses, instead of um, grouping our and um, ordering within the courses, uh, instead of doing that by topics or by modules, we decided to go with a week-by-week -week folder structure for practical reasons. We ask our students to turn in their homework twice a week, and that's usually on Wednesdays and on Sundays. <clears throat> and uh, we, uh, by doing uh, all of the things in folders, we found that uh, it was very easy for students to remember that. So you click on week one, you go into that folder and you start your homework up to a certain point, on Wednesday you submit it and you do the second part and you submit it on Sunday and then the following week you move into week two. So a lot of the time our learning and our learning modules, uh, you know, they crossed, they, uh, they started in one week, went into the second week and sometimes a test would take place in the middle of another week. But that was the structure that was the most and the best for, uh, for our student. Um, it's kind of hard to read here because of the, the, the projector, but this is a course that uh, talks about German culture and its contemporary German culture and the German legacy. So we're 
uh, talking about German identity here, we're talking about national socialism, about coming to terms with the past. And then we're moving in the second half of the course, we're moving into the East-West problematic. So East Germany versus West, uh, West Germany, unification, nostalgia for the East, and then Germany and the European Union, and uh, multicultural Germany, so uh, the Turkish Germans uh, and so on. This was a course that was built upon student feedback. And you heard in the video that we listened to the students. So our students said, we want a course on what Germany looks like and you know why Germany is the way it is and why Germans are the way they are. So we built this course based on, uh, uh, on their wishes here. Okay. Um, what we also found became very important was that our students wanted to know who we were. So instead of having discussion boards and putting things in writing, our students said, you know, but what do you look like and what do the other students in the class look like? We want to know who the people are. What we're doing right now is we're personalizing the courses by adding video, a lot of video to uh, the courses. Instructors are required to use video and the students too. So in week one, the first thing that a student uh, will get to see when he or she starts the course is going to be something like this. Let's assume you're taking German 113. It's uh, the last course in a three-part sequence, first year German. And you are taking the course with uh, Catherine, one of our instructors, and uh, this is what you would uh, click on first. Hello, alle, herzlich willkommen nochmals. Ich heiße Katrin, ich bin die Instruktorin für diesen Kurs. Und, um Das ist unser Textbuch, das ist ein neues Textbuch. So we have a new textbook, brand new for this class, 113. And Benita Platz 2. And you have all new materials to correspond with it. Now, ironically enough, we are starting with chapter 13. The chapters are numbered to correspond with the entire Berliner Platz sequence, which is why it's not chapter 1. So go ahead and get started with chapter 13. And you will find, as most of you are probably already familiar, your homework in the back of this main book, which corresponds directly to exercises in the front, and also the homework in your Intensive Trainer, which is now Intensive Trainer 2. So, Again, we will not be using the, in the cultural reader, the Treffpunkt da ad seha directly, but it's a great enrichment for you, and it also has a DVD in back for you to just view on your own for extra practice. And you will find the Glossa also on Blackboard. The Glossa is a PDF document with all the relevant vocabulary for this textbook. So you'll see that on the Glossa there are numbers that correspond to exercises in this book to help you with the vocab. Okay, bis bald, tschüss. And so for um, most of the assignments, a student would get similar instruction, a similar, you know, uh, assignment by Catherine going back on camera and saying, okay, open your book and so and so, let's look at this, let's talk about this. And uh, um, so kind of simulating the face-to-face uh, -face experience, but it's still only one way, right? So how do we do it the other way? Well, like I said, we ask our students to uh, have a camera and a microphone and a number of their homework assignments the students are required to turn in through video. Oral practice, practice with uh, other students. And uh, so as an example to show you what that might look like is I, I brought in a student from third year German and um, for those of you who speak German you uh, might uh, be able to pick up on her proficiency level. Um, what I like about, her name is Stephanie, what I like about Stephanie is that she is a, a tremendously shy student. She is um, a student who uh, um, rarely spoke up uh, in class. She is a student who used to be in Corvallis and then she started taking online classes. And uh, in class, in these face-to-face -face classes, I mean, she was one of the quiet, quietest students. You, you know these students too, right? The, the students who are good but who rarely speak. Well, um, she started taking these online, uh, the online classes. And uh, um, so I, I, was, um, I was surprised to see how much uh, she developed and what she was able to do and uh, how much uh, of uh, content, how much substance she was able to put in these video responses. So what she was not able to do in the classroom she all of a sudden was able to pack in here. I'm just going to play it for you. It's not subtitled because it was just the video response. It's a German culture course, the course that you saw earlier. But I'm just going to start playing into it. And uh, just also to show you how uh, students might um, are, are, are becoming comfortable with uh, 
the microphone and the camera after just a few weeks into uh, the term. Hallo, hier ist Stephanie. Ähm, diese Woche war auch schwer. Ich hatte ein Biochemieprofum am Freitag und die ganze Woche hatte ich vorbereitet. Äh, es war stressig und ich weiß, ich hatte nicht genug Zeit für Deutsch, aber nächste Woche werde ich viel mehr Zeit haben. Ähm, diese, diese Themen von, äh, von dieser Woche waren schwer, aber mein Lieblingsthema war über Selfies. Ich glaube, dass es wohl, ich hatte ein bisschen Erfahrung mit diesem Thema. Eine ein Freundin von mir äh, aus. Ähm so she uh, she talks about selfies and how um a friend of her took a selfie, a video selfie at the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, and how she found that this was inappropriate, very problematic. Uh, and uh, so um, she laid that out very nicely in two minutes in a way that I uh, was absolutely surprised to uh, see her do and hear her do in a third year German class. You know, so at a level very sophisticated and just wonderful. And uh, um, she's not the only one, she's not, I mean of course we have you know, a, a, a wide variety of proficiency levels but overall that's kind of what we started uh, uh, to uh, expect in our third year German courses now, so that we're starting to push the students even more in already in third year, they become much more proficient in fourth year. Now, one of the issues that we had was that, also with the textbook we chose, was that our students said, you know, um, grammar is still important to us, but we don't have these moments where we can ask our instructor, uh, these questions or you know we would really like to learn more about grammar beyond the book but we want our instructor to do that and um, we again did not want to use valuable classroom time or in this case we did not have any face-to-face -face time so we started what is known as a flipped classroom model and we started implementing that for our uh, e-campus for our online classes too so we took the first year German grammar split it up into uh, certain topics and screen captured with Camtasia the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the grammatical things that the students wanted or needed. It's an open access model, it's uh, on YouTube freely available and so I'm just going to play uh, uh, a couple of uh, minutes of the hammer grammar. Hello Alla, in this episode we're talking about the Imperative, imperativ. So, as the picture suggests, this is command language. So, we're being asked with the imperative to do something. Do it is what it says. Do it. So, in English, the imperative is pretty similar to it is in German. So, you can say go right, go left, stop stop at the sign like a stop sign so what do we see about these sentences so the verb is in the first position right well it's the same in german so in the german imperative i'll just uh, illustrate it with a little story so when i was living in austria uh, my austrian boyfriend at the time his mom really wanted me to eat because uh, she cooked really well, so she would tell me at the dinner table, is, 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 or just nim, because she wanted me to take the food, right, and then eat, eat, is, is. So let's unpack why this. So um, these videos are. Um they range in length from about five minutes to the longest, I think, is 22 minutes for the more complex subject. And uh, as you can imagine, these are tremendously popular with the students because they can go back all the time, they can pause, they can replay over and over again. And then they can do the exercises in the book and they can ask the instructor, you know, is this how it goes? And as an instructor, I might say, we'll go back to video so and so because it explains it in there. So again, you know, it kind of frees up my time uh, as a faculty member. So overall, has this been successful? In the video you heard about 40, uh, new majors where the video was made uh, a couple of years ago and so I um, brought the latest statistics and that is I guess the number that I uh, is important for you is this one here. So as of two weeks ago we have 140 German majors admitted to our program 
and uh, that has taken place in the last uh, three years because you know, the, uh, in 2009 we didn't have a major yet. We launched this major in 2011, 2012. In the first year we um, admitted 28 students, 28 new majors. Now we are at about 140, so I think at the end of this academic year, like two or three weeks from now, we will be right at around 150, which makes us the second largest program in the nation. Uh, not just online, you know, because we're the only online program, but in general. And that uh, is uh, kind of a nice turnaround from uh, three, four, well, I guess four years ago, five, no, even more, five, six years ago, when we were on, uh, on the chopping block as one of the under, uh, underperforming, low-performing programs at Oregon State because we could not even graduate 20 majors anymore because we didn't have those. You know, we had uh, a handful or two handfuls of majors in German and now all of a sudden we are on the other end. Uh, and uh, you know, that of course has helped us. Um, compared to the other languages, you can see that we have, oh, that's not coming across very well. So there are some other bars here for uh, 2013 and 14. Um, but you can see that all of these credit hours are credit hours that we didn't have before and German is not the only language that has uh, um, made the move online. It's uh, one of many languages. Some of these languages are only online in first and second year right now. Spanish just became the second major so they took the German model and uh, copied that and have now launched the BA in Spanish as well so that number will most likely go up. And I think numbers are fine, right? But what do you do with the students and how do you hear if the students like it or if they master the things. Well, like I said, we uh, have looked at uh, their proficiency level and that works. But I think the most convincing and also like for me was an email that I received from a student who's about to graduate three weeks from now. And this is what he wrote. That's uh, Justin and I'm going to leave you with that quote. So if we were to go back, uh, this year we will graduate our first three majors um, and three of those 140. Now many of them will take more than four, five or even six years to graduate because they can only take one class a year. Some of them will have to stop in between, like I said, we have a number of uh, students in the military. Some of them are not always able to take classes on a regular basis. So that will fluctuate and that of course is a challenge but then again no challenge because we have uh, understood and also our administration has understood that certain statistics do not work online the way they would for face-to-face -face programs. Um, so that's one of the, uh, the valuable experiences that we had. Okay so this is where we are um, and this is where I would like to turn the floor over to you to see if you have any questions or concerns. But thank you very much. Oh, so I think you were first. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I have a, que I have a question. This is very interesting, and thank you because um, I'm I work with native languages, Alaska native languages. I don't know if your program has worked at all with any of them. The native languages, and we have two of our, our native language teachers with us this afternoon. And you know, we, in some ways, we face different issues. In some ways, many of the same issues as other as foreign language teachers. But one thing that came up in your presentation that we face is the dialect question, because we have people, um, uh, you know, students wanting to learn different uh, dialects. And of course, German has many dialects. And here, I saw your teacher teaching an Austrian dialect. Is is and so I'm wondering how you deal with that. Um, we embrace it and in fact when we hire, I hire a diverse, uh, diverse uh, instructor population. So we have, uh, you know, you saw the student or the instructor who lived in Austria. We have someone who lived in Switzerland. I am a native German. Uh, we have a couple of instructors who are from the Czech Republic. And so you get that. We, we do not believe in like a standardized <coughs> way of teaching, you know, but we have students actually that's what we do, you know, we say you get an, a number of different dialects and you have to deal with it exactly the same way. I don't know if that's the same, you know, it's probably a, a different issue for you because of, of the things that you deal with. But uh, 
We just put it out on the table and say that's the reality. There is no standardized form of German and you have to just go with it. <coughs> I, I don't know who was next here. Uh, who's responsible for um, student recruitment? Do you guys handle that yourselves as a department or does the university help and how do you let people know that you have this great program online? Right. Uh, it's similar to what we have what you have here as e-learning. Ours is called eCampus and we have a marketing uh, department within that e-learning department. They take care of that. Um, so once a year I sit down with the marketing department of eCampus and we think about the strategy for the coming year. So I say I would like to have so and so many students and that's where I leave it you know, because I don't know how to do anything else. So I don't know how to place Google Ads and all of that. That's what they do but I say that's what I want to do and this is where I think it might be a good, a good, good uh, location to recruit. You know, sometimes I have that information. Like, let's say a university closes down a German program. I pick up my phone. I call the marketing person, and I say, "Hey, you know, don't you want to uh, do an ad at the local radio station or something?" You know, so they do something like that. But yes, we don't handle any of that. Yes, please. Um, so I'm wondering about structurally, if you still have face-to-face -face classes, is the major available face-to-face -face also or only online and do you duplicate classes or are some offered only online and some offered only face-to-face? -face? Uh, OSU requires us to teach uh, the same classes online and on campus, so we cannot teach a program only online, which kind of answers your question, right? Yes, so we have the same program um, on campus that we have online the same classes, the same curriculum, and students can actually jump in between. So sometimes when a student has a conflict with another major or you know, study abroad or whatever, they can take the class online and then they can move back into the face-to-face -face class because the outcomes are exactly the same for each class. So regardless of face-to-face uh, -face or online, we have exactly the same, same learning outcomes for each course and of course for the, the entire curriculum. And yes, everything is offered online and on campus. Yes, please. Sort of a follow-up. Um, you said you started from a fairly small amount of minors or majors and then expanded the program and you're teaching them both online and in class. Did you phase in or alternate semesters when one would be available compared to the other? And did you wait till you had a whole program ready or just phase it in with select classes? Yeah, so um, the first part of the question is, uh, did we, no, what's the, so let's start with the, did we wait? No, we did not. We started with uh, a number of classes and we told students, you know, as you move up, these classes will be available, but right now they are not yet. So we had a development plan that, of course, then we had to stick to because students were starting to rely on these classes and they were already advertised as coming in, let's say, winter term, spring term. So they were planning with the advisor um, about these classes. And, uh, but yeah. And um, did we alternate? Yes, we did. So uh, even though the, we found that there is uh, only a small danger of cannibalizing, um, in fact, there's almost no, as what we found out. But yes, we wanted to give students, campus students, uh, the opportunity to maybe finish out their degree sooner than later by taking online classes. Um, we have the same faculty, so we um, all teach online and on campus. Um, so, you know, to us it's not a threat. All the way in the back. You mentioned um, the, the gain, the time gain uh, that the teacher has. Um, from my experience, there's a critical um, startup investment required, which actually when you take the amount to get, um, all together, um, I'm not gaining time, I actually lose time. And in other words, I'm not paid for doing it. So, so my question is, have you any, any, any statistics about um, the engagement that a teacher needs for one class? Preparing it, running it, um, being employed on that specific class? Because it, one of the, the criticism is that, that you, we set up these digital classrooms and then we get basically hired out by uh, teaching associates or something. I mean, what, what's your union doing about this? Do we have any numbers on this where you really show the gain that um, you can devote really to the student instead of um, getting bogged down by technology, really? Right. Um, so um, I think a lot of the legwork needs to be done before you actually start the class. And you're right that you don't really gain any time overall. Um, in the end, for me personally, it's about the same. So teaching online, hybrid, 
or in the classroom, it's about the same number of hours I devote to a class. You know, to the teaching, to the mentoring, to the advising, to uh, the grading, um, and of course to the prep work in the beginning. In an online class at OSU, I am forced to have everything ready before the term starts. Which means that I, like I said, before week one, everything needs to be in place. All of the teaching, all of the documents, all of the assessment, and so on. What I do throughout the term is um, I, I grade, I mentor, I coach, and I troubleshoot. You know, but you know, some of these automated quizzes or whatever, they're done, I don't need to do anything or I just have to spot check. And that's it. Um, so, and I get paid for the development of that class at OSU. All of the time that I put in in the very beginning is not for nothing. So essentially I get paid for the development and then I teach it. But I already got paid for the development of a class. Do I get paid for the development of a class on campus? No way. So you know, see, to me this is already a gain because here I have a little bit more time and I have kind of double the salary, right? But of course I have to put in, in uh, the work beforehand. And there was a second part uh, to your question that I Institutional bias within the unions. Uh, faculty at OSU are not unionized. Um, so, and um, I think what um, what was important for us as faculty was that we were not afraid of these, uh, you know, these issues. And after all, we are the content experts. So yes, we might develop that, but we own the course. It's not our eCampus who owns the course. It's uh, it's situated in world languages and cultures. No one has to, the, it's just the delivery mode that is different, you know, so eCampus takes care of that and if a link is broken, I, I send an email to uh, an instructional designer or a webmaster and say, that link is broken, fix it please, and they fix it for me. But if, if something needs to be changed, that's mine, you know, so no one else can touch that course, it's always mine. Uh, we as faculty, as German faculty, own our curriculum and no one else. No one can make changes to, to that and I think that's very important, you know. So the integrity is still there. We decide who teaches that class, uh, we decide who makes changes to that class. And we found that every three to four years right now, we have to revise that class too. And uh, that is something that someone coming in from the outside cannot do because, you know, we have the expertise, we do the professional development. So, um, you know, we, we don't really have like no fear basically of, of this. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. So what does your workload look like? How many classes does a typical pro professor or instructor for you guys teach hybrid face-to-face -face online? Right, so um, if uh, in, in a tenure track position, it's uh, our workload is a two, 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 and that can be a combination of anything. So it can be, um, one online, one on, ca on campus, can be two online, can be two on campus, can be two hybrid. So, uh, you know, any permutation of that is fine, but it's, it's a two, two, two would be a standard workload. An instructor would teach a four, 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 you know, for a full-time employment. And same thing, we, uh, they can do it uh, in, you know, in any order here. So online, on campus, whatever we need is basically. So we ask um, our hires to be flexible, you know, the ones who are in Corvallis, they know that they can expect a certain amount of on-campus classes, but also probably a number of online classes, since this is where we are the strongest. Sebastian, could you talk a little bit about the faculty discussions that you had at the department level when you were redesigning the curriculum and trying to make sure that the outcomes match up and what those discussions were, were kind of like and how you came to consensus? The revision of our German curriculum after the first iteration of... Uh, or even just at the beginning when you were looking to, to transfer the face-to-face -to, -face to, to online. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a nice little story because the, uh, you know, I, I joined OSU in 2008 as an assistant professor. And that was the moment when, you know, pretty quickly into uh, my uh, starting uh, moment there, we uh, got the notice that um, programs were in danger, we had to consolidate, programs were being cut, and one of the programs on the chopping block was, you know, German for underperforming. A at the same time we had this initiative going on that, you know, you could put your program online, you could apply for funding, and so I thought, well, maybe that's a good moment uh, to see if um, I can save my position, my job there. 
I went in a faculty, faculty meeting with the entire foreign language department and uh, I asked if it was okay for German to pilot this program. I said, you know, this, and of course everyone told me, yes, you're stupid, you know, this is not going to work, uh, you're going to fail miserably, but yes, feel free to try. So, um, <laughs> You saw a lot of the concerns that I put up uh, at the front end here. And these were, were um, actually things that came up in these discussions, but essentially no one was opposed to that because the moment uh, I think was critical enough that everyone said, you know, someone needs to do it or someone can do it. It's not going to be us. How about we let the German do it? And, you know, so here we go. Yes, there was, was a lot of uh, uh, skepticism on uh, the side of, uh, of uh, faculty but in the end they were fine with someone piloting it. Now what we we're having right now is that um, the other languages are seeing the success of German. And like I said, <coughs> Spanish has now taken our model and is implementing it um, pretty much one-to-one -one for their Spanish BA. French is working on uh, the, the French BA right now and a couple of other languages are working <laughs> on, uh, on minors or at least trying to put their uh, first and second year language programs online. And I don't know if this is what you were hoping for or looking for as the, the answer or if you were thinking of something else. Well, also too, when you're talking about the, the curriculum and the outcomes, I assume you had to have some discussions about how each of those classes and the, the overall program meets them when you're not able to do that lecture. And so how did you come up with some of the ideas on how you deliver the material at the beginning? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so um, once we figured out that we wanted to do that and we had the student outcomes, you know, we figured out that some of the things would not work in that classroom. But what we did is we just sat down and we talked. So we made sure that we, uh, we found different strategies or we, we, we had, uh, we really sat around the table and talked about, you know, what, what could we do? How could we approach things? And then we split up the work um, more or less equally. So you saw in a lot of these uh, uh, videos or instances that Catherine, one of our instructors, um, was present. She was the one who uh, was put in charge of the first year program. You know, some others worked on third and fourth year. So we uh, divided it equally, but it was always an open discussion and we made sure that everyone knew that we had to have the outcomes. So we have an outcome-based curriculum. The path there, uh, there was, um, it was pretty much open to anyone. So there's a lot of faculty flexibility. We are not put into like one of these very rigid models. We just look at the outcome. So if someone said, I really want to teach this and this, then we said, go ahead and teach this and this, as long as you accomplish the learning outcomes that we all agreed on. So we still have the freedom to do whatever we want, and that's also important. When I teach a German Lit course and I really want to teach uh, different literature than my colleague, I can do so. Of course, I will have to you know, develop that class this way if I don't want to take his reading list. But I can if I want to, and no one is going to stop me because, again, the outcomes. Um, given that you observed student games and hybrid over face-to-face, -face, and that that's kind of a natural path towards looking at what to do online, what does a hybrid class look like at OSU, since that can mean many things? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, hybrid class at OSU means that uh, instead of, let's say for a three credit class, that would mean uh, three hours, three contact hours per week in the classroom, a hybrid class um, puts that at half of the time. So when I teach a hybrid class, a three credit hybrid class, I meet with my students once a week for 80 minutes. And uh, I, um, in these 80 minutes, we do things. So I am kind of the coach in the classroom. My students study on their own using that flipped classroom model, you know, so some of the things you, you saw. Let me just give you an example of a film class that I teach. My students watch the movies at home, they do readings at home, they uh, collaborate at home um, on uh, certain things, and then we come back to the classroom and we apply the things they learned by doing hands-on things. So they learned about special effects in the classroom, we practiced special effects. They built uh, backdrops of Legos, and uh, they learned how to how uh, Fritz Lang in Metropolis in 1927 did his special effects with mirrors and Legos and uh, their cell phones. So that's what it would look like at OSU, you know, half the, the meeting time and the rest online. Mm -hmm. Do you have some um, like national tests at the end, like the, taking the OPI that 
that they take, you have them take in both? Mm -hmm. Right now we're in the process of uh, uh, implementing the Goethe tests, uh, the A1, A2 for the Common European Framework. Uh, that is something we have not in place yet, but that we're rolling out right now. We're in the process of revising the curriculum based on student input again. And one of the things that came up was the student feedback saying, you know, it's all nice having that degree, but I think it would also be nice to have exactly that. And so that's why we're bringing in these uh, tests right now at the end of each year that they can then take to a prospective employer, for example, and say, here is my certification. I am B2. And, uh, you know, of course, the company knows exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's coming right now. Yes? How do you um, facilitate your student feedback? How do we facilitate that? How does that happen? Um, well, it's, it's um, we have, I mean, things like discussion boards, informal, also formally with the student evaluations of teaching where we add additional questions so they can remain anonymous. We have also done... Um, 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 like questionnaires, you know, like SurveyMonkey or things that um, had to go through the IRB um, process uh, at, uh, at Oregon State. But it's like a, a number of different things, you know, formal and informal conversations with the students. Yeah. And we always tell them that we are open to anything. So those students who don't want to, who want to remain anonymous, they use like the SurveyMonkey, for example, as a platform to voice their concerns. And there are, then there are always students like, you know, Justin, who, that was an unsolicited email. He just sent an email basically saying, thank you, I had a great experience. Uh, I want to share with a lot of people that this was wonderful and that, you know, online learning really works. showed us all the advantages and you really sugarcoated it in a, in a very nice way. I'm wondering about, you know, having taught uh, myself, there are many ugly, there can be ugly situations in teaching. Uh, let's say great disputes. Did you go through a great dispute, uh, you know, where people say my computer was breaking down, my Macintosh didn't deal with the PC. Like, I mean, what, what are the ugly parts that, that, that you want to share with us? Because, uh, again, great dispute is a classic example for this, because if, you really, if it really comes to a lawsuit or to some really legal type of situations, is, is that model robust enough and backed up that it really can hold up and defend the grades? Yeah, and I think that's, that's wonderful that you're bringing this up because, of course, I'm sugarcoating it here, right? You know, all of the, th the nice things that work and how wonderful it can be, but the really dirty stuff I did not, did not tell, you know. So the, um, the, the many problems, it's like, of course, it's a day-to-day -day struggle, you know, like in the face-to-face -face classroom, there are so many things that come up all the time. The students saying, you know, my computer didn't work. Like, sure, well, do it again, you know. So, of course, you, ca you have to accommodate students. You have to work with, uh, we have to work with our eCampus folks who can track the login, you know, to say, yes, but that student logged on, you know, or that student had another window open, or, you know, there seems to be something odd because uh, the tests do not match with uh, the, uh, or the proctor tests do not match with the homework assignments and so on and so forth. So um, yes, you always have to be very, very flexible and you also have to work with the student and uh, the eCampus people to make sure that things are, uh, you know, uh, they, that they work in a way. But yeah, things go wrong every, every single day, you know. So um, I think there would be way too many things to tell you right now. But like I said, whatever you think can get, go wrong will go wrong at some point. And I, that's just the fact of online learning, yes. It will never be perfect uh, the same way that face-to-face uh, -face learning will never be perfect. A comment, and I, th I think it's actually great for teachers where to be challenged that way, and I like it a lot. And to be challenged with technology and being fluent myself <coughs> on the media issues, often the students know the media much better than I do. Um, but what I'm lacking there in the system is, is, is some sort of resilience or, or, or backup or support or understanding that when you have such a class online, it probably takes a year, one or two years uh, where things will not go really well, and then after the third or fourth year, it might go well. You know, I mean, I mean that that, that play play time, mm -hmm. that 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 buffer, that robustness yes. in the evaluation. As, as a faculty member, I, I'm lacking that, and I think that's where eventually we all lack the resources really to switch and to to experiment. Um, and I don't know how you handle with experimentation. I mean, it either works or doesn't. Swim or sink. Right. But uh, many faculty mm -hmm. many faculty cannot do it. And uh, we at OSU have the opportunity to fail. And I say failure, so in here I say failure because we do. Um, many of these courses that I talked about did not work the first time. Some didn't even work the second time, you know, so, but we have the opportunity uh, to fail and to redo. So um, 
a number of these courses, like I said, didn't work. And I went back and said, you know, the course didn't work. I need to redevelop that course. In order to do that, I need the money again because I cannot do it on top. I will again have to invest 200 hours uh, to redo the, the course completely based on student feedback and based on uh, the, my experience with that class right now. And, and that is an opportunity that uh, OSU and OSU eCampus has given us as faculty. And that I think is one of the, the components why we are successful, because we have that mentality right now and the chance to fail, you know. So it's the, uh, the chance to, to experiment, to say, let's just try it and let's see what happens. And if it doesn't work, we're going to try it again. And if it doesn't work, we're going to try it again, you know, and we change it again and again and again until we get it right. Of course, we won't be able to do that for six or seven years. You know, at some point, uh, even our administration will say, you know what, you've tried six or seven times. How about you get it right at some point, you know, or do some research. But if you fail and if you can show from that student feedback and from your own experience how you're changing, you apply for funding and you get the funding and you get to redo it again. But you're absolutely right. Without that support, it is not possible. And I say it's not possible um, because, um, you know, no one can expect you as faculty member to do that work for free. It is a lot of work and there is a substantial investment and the university has to invest in that. And this is why it has worked for us, because our university has invested a lot of money. So to give you a number, this uh, degree in its first iteration, the German degree um, cost the university a quarter million dollars without getting anything out of that. So that was an upfront investment they had to make. And now, of course, we're revising, so they're adding on the money, you know, but um, at, the, at the tail end here, you know, there, there is some, um, I guess, some benefit, you know, some student credit hours, things that the students, uh, the, the university got out of it. Yes. When, when you mention the quarter million, is that like actual dollars paid out, or is that in work release time, or in your, your development contracts, or what, what is that quarter million? That was money paid out for, um, so we could see eCampus does not do any, uh, does not hire anyone. So that was money paid out to the department to pay for the development and to pay for, uh, for the teaching of these classes. So the, um, the, each development was paid with a certain dollar amount. And uh, the, uh, the work that I did as uh, faculty lead was paid because all of that coordination work, they're making sure that all of the faculty developers stayed on track. The talking to our e-campus, you know, the making sure that things were in place and could be rolled out. All of that was, yeah, was paid for, was but it was not. Was that paid as overload or was that like, that was release time out of your workload? To um, do so that either way, we have the option of doing it either way. I took it in load because, uh, you know, I have no time to give anymore. So there are no more hours in my day. So I said, I would like to have it in load. And there was never a discussion about that. Yes, always, whatever we wanted to. Mm -hmm. I, my biggest fear is, um, thank you, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, this was kind of um, uh, an awakening. I, I'm not going to tell you what kind. Um, <laughs> but, um, but my fear is I'm the only faculty. And, um, and for, me, for someone to, or you know, the higher up to say, well, you're going to do e-learning. and. Um, that's where I start biting nails, um, because how can I create a bachelor's degree by myself um, and teaching at the same time? You know, I, I don't know if you have any um, issues like this that have come up in um, in your experience with other uh, with other uh, teachers, uh, but uh, that's where I that's just one reality kind of a mm -hmm. question. Yes. So that was exactly my situation. The instructors and my colleague came on board afterwards. I didn't have these colleagues before. The, they are a result of that program going uh, online and developing. Before we had a traditional program, program on campus, I had a senior colleague who resisted everything and anything that I proposed. And the two instructors who ta taught full time for us were instructors that he had hired. So they were uh, uh, in his, uh, you know, in his, uh, um, yeah, on his side. Um, but I did it myself. So it takes a lot of work um, in the beginning, but I think it can be done. You know, you just have to be convinced and uh, you have to be ready to, you know, to, to, uh, to embark on that, also to accept failure. 
and uh, you know, and find allies. Maybe not uh, within your faculty, but on the administrative side or the e-learning side. I think there's a lot of support if you are willing. And maybe not an entire curriculum right away, but maybe a couple of courses to show that yes, it can be done. You know, develop these courses. Um, maybe they are successful. Find ways to make them successful, and then take it from there. You will find the allies. But that's exactly what my situation was like. Yeah, one person. No friends. <laughs> yes. Is there a way we could see a, a lesson or a little trailer kind of thing that's the actual lesson going on rather than talking about the talking about it? What what it would look like besides the woman showing the book and Right. So yeah, in the weekly folder, I mean, I can only tell you right now, I don't have access to any of the courses right now because I'm not an instructor of record on any of these courses. Um, but in each folder, you would get whatever the instructor dis or the developer decided was going to be taught. So it's going to be a list of things that the student has to complete each week. So it might be, um, you know, Number one, click on this. The video comes up. Catherine says, OK, you know, we are going to uh, learn about uh, verb forms in German. So um, here's a link to the, uh, the video, the flipped classroom, the hammer grammar. Watch that video and then come back and go to your book and uh, do this exercise. Go to the workbook, do this exercise, send it back to us. Here's a little quiz so you can test and see if what you, do, if you, what you did was right. Then uh, go find a partner, a peer in among the group of uh, students here. Get together with that, uh, that peer and um, you know, come up with a short conversation. So things that we would do in like a face-to-face -face classroom too is what we are replicating to some extent, uh, you know, transferring over and never one-to-one -one because that's not possible, but we're finding ways to do the things that we do in the classroom online. You know, and with these deadlines, with the two deadlines saying, by Wednesday. And then you can work with that for the second half of the week as an instructor. Yeah, and I wish I could, you know, I'm sorry, but yeah. I only taught a hybrid course last, or this term, so I don't have access to any of the others. Sorry. It'd be great to have, you know, even a YouTube that would, you could look at. Yeah, it doesn't really work like this it. way, you know, with the YouTube, because it's, um, you open up that week, that folder in, right. right now, also in Canvas, and you get all of these things that uh, a student needs to complete. You know, so it's like when you put something on Blackboard or whatever, you know, right in here. Yes? I would suggest that there are a lot of open online learning classes for language that you could look at to see pretty much the same kinds of things you would see if you went behind the curtains with Sebastian's class. Oh. Um, so you can see the kinds of varieties of assignments and activities and what students are doing. There are, there are many open examples out there. Um, Google can help or e-learning instructional designers or staff are happy to help you find more examples too. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to share, I've been adding a special ed course in my master's program each semester and working with course designers through e-learning and it's been a really wonderful process and it's getting faster and faster and each time I add a new little twist to see how that will work with the students and the students have given really good feedback to know what works but I also I think what you said you have to have that face time and so I have two to five meetings depending on the class with the students so we can we can visit and chat but it's been a really a rich experience and the students are saying uh, they're getting just as much if not more from the online class i'm glad you're sharing this because it actually shows that it really works and that it's not just the languages or not just us but it's just a matter of how you design the course that it, i believe it can work in pretty much any environment and for any subject it's just a matter of how you and you know how you do things and what you do in these environments and you know obviously the still that face-to-face -face time with the student you know one of the worries that I listed in the beginning it's crucial that our students know who we are and that they still get the uh, the synchronous contact with us that they can still communicate with us that they know who we are not only through the screen and through a time lag but also live and yes sometimes it means that I have to Skype with the student at 2 a.m. because that student is somewhere in you know in Europe not all the time, but it happens sometimes. You know, when there's really a problem, well, you know, yes, I guess I can do it once a term or so. Great. All right. Thank you very much.